We really have to understand that going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the devil has hated Eve. Furthermore, he's hated Eden itself. He hates the natural beauty which God has made. He hates everything that's true to creation. And today, as we continue our study of Revelation 17, what we find is a continuation of the events that were in Revelation 16. In Revelation 16, we see the wrath of God poured out upon the earth against these vile and vicious monsters of men who only rebel and do evil. But they don't respond to any sort of correction, any sort of reproach or discipline as a righteous person might do. And by that I mean righteous people don't always find discipline to be pleasurable because, again, it's discipline. It's being punished, so it doesn't always feel good. But they do have a respect for the truth. They realize I've made an error, I've made a mistake. And just like a father may discipline his children, when we look upon our Heavenly Father, we realize we are in error. And we may not like that, but we will at least respect that and then turn towards the truth. This is written about time and time again in the book of Proverbs, that those who love discipline, well, they love wisdom. They love instruction. They love truth. But those who hate reproach, they are brutish, they are foolish, and they are ultimately dumb. And though there are those wicked people who despise any sort of correction there in Revelation 16, what we find is that it's not just enough for them to double down. No, no, no they will ratchet it up even more. Now, we need to understand quite a bit about this because oftentimes we we don't want evil to, to ramp things up and we might be a little bit reluctant to do something good if that's going to make evil ramp things up. But then we just find ourselves held hostage by the devil. The devil saying, if you act, I'll act. That's not how God operates. God knows the devil will rebel. Just like in Matthew chapter 8 when Jesus casts out demons, the people of the town, they come and beg him to leave doesn't stop Jesus, though, because it needs to be done. As we come to Revelation 17, I want to begin by saying the devil has unmade Eve. What began in the garden with a little half-truth whispered hither and thither into the ears of God's woman, it has now been concluded in that distant wilderness at the end of time. Insofar as demons are fallen angels, Eve has finally collapsed beneath all dignity of grace to become the unwoman. Now, we understood this in in the old days that people might collapse beneath human dignity, become a monster. The Anglo-Saxon language, they have a lot of words for for manslaughter, words like manslain, which sound very similar to that. They have words for homicide, for killing people, for murder, and all sorts of things like that. But they also have a word, manmaring, which means the unmaking of man, the destruction of man. They even have their word for monster, which is the unman one who is no longer human. They have gone beyond that. And what we find here in Revelation is the unwoman. So with that being said, thank you for joining me here at Kingdom of the Logos. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. Let's jump into Revelation 17, read the chapter, and then we'll come back and study it. Because what we find here really is the hatred of Eden. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and he talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Let's pause right here. In verse 1 of Revelation 17, what we see is this woman, who I'm going to describe and define as the unwoman. She is sitting upon many waters. That's the first introduction we have to her. Now again, I think this whole chapter is reminiscent and rebellious against Genesis chapters 1 through 3, where you see God making this beautiful garden, which again, we we sometimes think of gardens, jungles, wilderness. These are overlapping ideas a lot of times in our head, though gardens tend to have a lot of order. They have structure. There's rhyme and reason to it, where wilderness is something that seems a little less organized in our mind. And in fact, one of them is kind of just given over to do as nature might please, and the other is very specific with gardeners tending it. Well, in Genesis 1, we see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, hovering over the face of the deep. Here in Revelation 17, it begins with a woman sitting upon upon the many waters. I don't think that's a coincidental image. Verse 2 says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. What we find here in this next verse is rebellion against the family, rebellion against the 
the design that God gave for Adam and Eve. They're, they're meant to come together in marriage. You're not supposed to have this sort of fornication where you've got this one woman and all of these kings coming to fornicate with her. That's, that's a rebellion on every hierarchy, every family, and every, every element that God has woven into to creation. And all the people who have lived righteously with that. It, it's a breaking of that. Verse 3 says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Right, so here we see the whore sitting now upon the beast. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was written a name, Mystery, Babylon, the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Again, this is the language of of monsters. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered in great admiration. Going back a chapter. You see the waters of earth turn to blood. It's reminiscent of, of course, the Exodus. But the waters turn to blood is a punishment. This is supposed to be a punishment of you went out and you sown death. Now you are reaping death. Well, what you find here is someone who will not be mocked. She is not going to be bothered by the turning of blood to waters. In fact, she's going to go out. She's going to grab a cup. She's going to raise it to the sky and say, oh, you wanted to turn this blood to be my new drink. Well... I will drink it proudly. You wanted to turn the waters to blood as punishment? Oh no, I will not be punished. This will be my pride. And the angel said unto me, this is verse 7, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which have the seven horns, or excuse me, the seven heads and ten horns. The beach that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Again, one of the things that the scripture is trying to communicate to us is that how blasphemous the beast is. When we go to Revelation 13 and you see the image of the beast, scripture is trying very, very hard to tell us that this thing It is alive and breathing, though it is not part of the natural order. It should not exist. Every child that is born comes from its parents. Its parents have passed the breath of life onto it. And again, with that comes some traits and things of that nature. But the breath of life is born from parents who also have that breath of life. It cannot be done without both of the parents. It cannot be done without the breath of life, them being alive. You don't see like a child born of parents who who are dead. The parents have to be alive to conceive that child and it has to be passing on. Like there's a direct continuation of life. Death, by the way, doesn't have a direct continuation. Something can be alive and then die. And there can be another death pop up across the street. Life has a direct continuation. Death does not. But yet this image of the beast, it is not born. It is alive, though unborn. It is the final blasphemy. It is blasphemy against all the the laws of nature, all the laws of morality. Every fetter that holds together creation, it is a rebellion against. And again, it is something which is even not part of existence, even though it is. It is something which was and is not and yet is. It's a confusing thing because it is a blasphemous thing. It is the final blasphemy. Verse 9 says, And here here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And the seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. Now again, a lot of this can get confusing. But I want us to read the book of Revelation, especially for its plot. It comes as a direct revelation to John from Jesus, and John is to carry it to the churches, which, by the grace of God, he did. Revelation, it is either true or it is not. Either it is coming from Jesus to John, or it is not. And if that is a lie, then all of Scripture is a lie. 
and then our faith is nothing. We like to pretend that there's a lot of nuance around this book, and you know what? There is nuance in some of the symbols and some of the language that is used, but as far as the plot to the book goes, it is either true or it is not. The fact of Revelation does not have nuance. It either is or it doesn't. It either is the story of the final judgment, the judgment of all living and dead, and then the new creation, or it is not. There is no nuance in that area. Now, when it comes to some of the specific details that we get there, we can get lost in trying to find, you know, a symbol here. We want to put over there a formula, and that oftentimes gets us wrapped up. But the truth of the matter is it's showing a plot to us. It's showing to us that at the end of days, you're going to see these final blasphemies come up. People are going to be deceived in mass. There's not going to be any middle ground. There will be those who accept the mark of the beast and worship the evil. And then there will be those who say, no, Jesus is Lord. And those people are going to be persecuted at the most malevolent and vicious sense. And in the end, Jesus is going to show up and sort it all out in like the snap of a finger and there'll be a new creation. Now, what we find here is that there are the, the peculiarities that come whenever worldly schemers come together. There's a number of kings. They kind of do their separate things. They, they intertwine with the, the whore of Babylon, the unwoman. They intertwine with the beast. But it's all just evil, evil upon evil. But one of the facts of this, this plot that I do think is interesting, and I'm going to come back to when we get to our sermon notes, is that the beast goes to and from earth into perdition, into the bottomless pit. Now, whether you go and you look at Luke 16 and you hear about this man in hell who wants to send a messenger back, which again, that's a parable from Jesus, but we also know there are, there are people in hell. You, you can go and read number 16 if you want more on that. Um, we cannot just go to and fro, back and forth between heaven. That's a, a power and responsibility that only belongs to God. I think there is a, a literal problem with the Tower of Babel that we oftentimes want to overlook. We want to, to shrink all the stories down, and we forget some of the big themes in it. People literally want to make some sort of expanse between heaven and earth. Now, they're not actually capable of it, but they, they still have a mind to do that. We, we want to do... A lot of things that isn't possible for us to do and we do a lot of great evil along the way you, you find this happens all the time people get in their mind they can do something they can't do and i mean th there's a lot of situations in our modern day and age we see this where people want to physically restructure themselves change whether they're a man or a woman and they, they can't really do that and a lot of evil happens along the way and and people are preyed on again the, the whole ideology that tells uh, young men and young women that they can change who they are it is a a sexual predation done against them. It's a form of, of molestation, telling young people this. And it is of the, the darkest and most malevolent sort. It is very evil telling this to these people. Um, and again, they can't really do that, but you can do a lot of evil along that route. And that's what happens there in the story of the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 6, you actually do see creatures going back and forth between heaven and earth that aren't supposed to. And they're not people. They're actually angelic sons of God. They're not son of God like Jesus, but that's just the pre-Moses old, old way of describing um, angels. You see these, these creatures going back and forth, and they come down to earth, and they, they take daughters of man and want to have children with them, and you get the Nephilim born. That's the beginning of Genesis 6 and also the precursor to the flood. And God looks upon that and says, no, this isn't happening anymore. When I established the heavens and the earth there in Genesis 1, there are lands. God drawing forth the dry land is actually a pretty phenomenal thing. When you go back and see that happen, God is saying that, you know, you, you can fall, but only so far. You don't actually go outside and trip, whether you trip literally or you trip symbolically into sin. Um, you don't trip and go straight to hell when you do that. You've got some time for repentance. Um, actually having the land beneath our feet to keep us from the bottomless pit, the, the void, is, is a very good thing. But what you find here is, is that law of, of nature has no power over the beast. He goes from earth to the bottomless pit. And I know a lot of this sounds kooky, and it either is kooky or it's not. It's either true or it's not. It's just kind of how it is. And um, I believe in the book of Revelation. I believe it is true, and I believe this is the, the end of time as we know it, and then the new birth of new creation with a new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Okay, let's go back and begin in verse 12. It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. 
They have one mind, and they shall give their power and strength unto the beast. When I originally was going to do this sermon, I was going to do it as a political message, because there's actually a lot of politics woven into this, but I want us to, to more focus on Genesis. But nonetheless, what you do see here are global conspiracies where they all have a singular plan. You see them coming together. Their, their plans haven't come into fruition, but they're scheming and all of that stuff yet. We, we see that real power, real evil, real governments, real kingdoms are being established in the final days. And they're, they're utterly established upon evil, which itself is going to be one of the rebellions against God's laws we'll get to when we, we have our, our sermon notes here in a moment. Verse 14, they shall make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Again, you do find infighting. Evil is corrupt. It's not good to live among corrupt people. Uh, you, you do see that that evil will turn to eat its own. And of course, the house divided will fall. In the end, uh, Satan loses. <laughs> we, one of the things which is pretty funny about that is, as Jesus openly says, if Satan is divided against Satan, Satan will lose. And, and you, you do know that they actually do lose in the end. Evil is quite often divided against itself and it loses in the end. It doesn't produce any good fruits like we see there with Jesus. Jesus is actually producing a good fruit when he done that. He is succeeding in his, his goal um, because he is not divided against himself. He is not of Satan. He's of God doing good things. Verse 17, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Okay, let's get to our sermon notes. So the devil has unmade Eve. What begins in the Garden of Eden with a little half-truth whispered into the ears of God's woman, it's now concluded in that distant wilderness here in the book of Revelation at the end of time. And again, I want to reiterate this. For as much as demons are fallen angels, the same thing can happen to man. Eve has finally collapsed. She's collapsed beneath all dignity of grace to become the unwoman. That's what we see with the the harlot here in Revelation 17. And what we find is she is a monster. You go back to that Anglo-Saxon word, the unman. Uh, there's another Anglo-Saxon word, manfrey, which means one who is who is so much the unman, so much the monster that they actually become a lord of evil. And that's one of the synonyms in the Anglo-Saxon language for the devil, Satan, Lucifer. And again, there's there's a lot of words that you might use for the devil, but one of them is manfrey in the, the true old English tongue. Eve has now become the unwoman. She is a, a lord of evil. She is in league with the beast, in league with the dragon, Satan. And again, the beast is blasphemous. She's in league with them. And what you see here is a bunch of uncreatures ruling over the earth in defiance of all that God hath made. They're uncreatures. Demons, they're uncreatures. Satan is an uncreature. He's a fallen angel who has rejected his nature so much that he is unmade himself. And you look at this, and a lot of people are, are torn. They say, is this daughter of Eve a symbol, or is she really a human? But the truth of the matter is actually not so simple here. And this isn't me adding nuance to the text. It's actually looking at the events inside the text and saying they themselves are the things which have the nuance. When you become a monster, when you reject grace, like the, the serpent has, like the, the devil has, there is some nuance in whether or not you're actually a creature anymore. Sin unmakes us. The devil was at one point in time an angel and now is not. It's, it's a little bit unclear where he fits in the created order because he has rejected himself in the created order. It's not part of reason or logic. He's now part of chaos. The woman, she has rejected her humanity. Its, it's frame is untethered. Now she's something abominable. Is she a symbol for a city? Is she actually a person? The, the answer cannot be found because she has unmade herself. She has torn apart the fabric which holds her body together and become a monster. This is Revelation 17. And as terrible as all of that sounds, I want us to consider some of the specifics of how the beast and the woman come together to blaspheme against all the raw elements of creation. 
You might notice some small details in there, which I like to point out. That she is surrounded by gemstones, not just materials formed by man, like the purple there. Though again, purple, it's a color, it's a part of nature, so even that, that's not fully just a product of man. Um, but she, she's surrounded by the natural beauties of God. She even has a, a cup of gold to drink the blood in. She, she takes things which are actually found out in nature and surrounds herself with them to pervert them. She even goes out there into the, to the wilderness. And you might notice that imagery of the wilderness. Just like I pointed out earlier, it is bringing us back to the garden. The devil hates the Garden of Eden. And finally, here at the end of time, all the way, I mean, it's taken all the way from our most ancient ancestors, through the ages, through the generations, through the eras, through the tongues, he finally has his own little Eden. And it's this wilderness with the woman in it. And it's abominable on every level. So all these facts are certainly present, but the rebellion is deeper still. In denial of the first day of creation, the woman sits above the waters, as if it is her spirit that might command them. Wherefore God called forth the sky on the second day, the woman, she now beckons across the skies above all the nations. She summons every king under the firmament to join her in, for, in fornication. In rebellion against the third day, the beast is not limited by the land which God forms, and he so travels to and fro betwixt earth and the bottomless pit again. In Genesis 1, we find the natural law. We find these fetters which bind creation together that, that can't just so simply be snapped. Well, on the fourth day, God set the sun with the moon to work together in tandem, illuminating the earth. Now, the woman and the beast are united to darken it. On the fifth day, when God called forth the living creatures, it was to be good and beautiful. But now the unwoman and the beast, they revel in death. They revel so much in death that they are debauching themselves in the blood of martyrs. In hating the sixth day, the family is killed in adultery. Such adultery as would ruin every nation on earth and even those nations which are yet to come. And finally, where on the seventh day God rested, this conspiracy of evil has never rested and is given both an eternity and an instant to every malevolent hunt, the devil has been patient to create this wilderness all the way since the closing of the Garden of Eden. Now the woman and the beast, they do dwell in the wilderness. It is the final hatred against Eden. No laws restrain them, whether it be those natural laws, such as gravity and land and sky, nor the moral laws which instruct one on how to behave. Nothing which sews together the world in its physical aspects or which binds it together in the good, beautiful morality. None of them will restrain them. The unwoman and the beast, they have despised every goodness of God's design, soiling it in every way and to every extent. And this hatred, it's not something that's just a misguided error. It is that hideous hatred which has patiently ignored every hour of grace from the beginning of time. It has waited long for a sovereign throne, and now, now it has finally got it. You know, at the Tower of Babel, they wanted to make a name for themselves and failed. Here, they have succeeded. Oh, yes, the, the fallen angels wanted fornication where they could give birth to monsters and abominations, and that, too, was foiled, but now it has succeeded. And with great debauchery comes great blasphemy. And specifically, the adulterous acts of Revelation 17 come as a direct rebellion against God's punishment. The wrath of God is poured out by his angels in chapter 16, but the villains here only double down in their sin. Revelation 16.21 tells us, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. And then moving to the specific issue of blood. We, we've talked about this, but I want to just give us some specific references in Scripture so we can be very literate on the matter. In Revelation 16, 6, one of the angels declares how God is right and just to, to punish people who have done such unchaste evil. And this angel says in Revelation 16, 6, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them now blood to drink, for they are deserving. They deserved this. Galatians 6, 7 teaches, do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. God is not mocked. Whatever for a man might sow, that he shall also reap. 
That even ties back to when God establishes the, the, the trees and the fruits that they have there in Genesis 1. You have a tree, its seed goes in the ground, and it comes forth a new tree according to its kind. Animals, they come together and they, they procreate and they give birth to new animals that are according to their kind. That is the law of nature. Whatever for you might sow, that you shall also reap. The waters turn to blood as a just and righteous, worthy punishment for those who sow death. But what you find here in this ultimate evil of the unwoman, this monster, is that she will not be shamed. She will not respect correction. In Revelation 17, 6, it says, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs. And when I saw her, I wondered in great admiration. We even know that in this chapter, she has a golden cup in her hand and she pulls it out. And she reaches it up towards the sky and just drinks these abominations, these blasphemies, because she has made a joyful sport of the hideous scene. She will not hold the blood in reverent horror, but instead she makes it her trophy. The cup of death is not her curse, it rather is her trophy. And it's a dangerous thing what you see here. This is where you kind of get in some of the, the politics that this is teaching us about. It is a dangerous thing to hate accountability. To despise the hand of correction. To be corrected is very embarrassing. It's embarrassing whenever you get corrected. It's not fun to be disciplined. It's, it's not something which is enjoyable. But the righteous do make peace with it. And you can tell how earnest people are. This is, again, this is political right here. Whether they're in, in you know, governmental politics, they're leaders in the church. You can tell who is earnest by how they react to correction. Indeed, leaders often make mistakes. And those who are earnest will respect the plight of their people. However, those who are wicked will only double down in their mistakes. For the mistakes aren't actually mistakes at all, but they're the design of chaos. In our world, we see right now leaders who don't care, they, they, they'll just come out and lie to you and say, oh, it's not getting more expensive. It's not getting harder to live. It's not getting harder to pay your bills. The, the reason why they ignore you is because the chaos is by design. When ugliness is your goal, suddenly boils, wounds, and howls of terror have very little power over you. That was the plan all along. You don't mind that. When the lie is the point, you don't mind that somebody calls you out for being a liar. It was the point all along to be a liar, so you don't mind that. Sure, you might like to have a facade here and there, but I mean, the point is to be a liar. So being called a liar slows you down, not at all. The wicked of Revelation are not hindered by the wrath of God. They want the destruction of the earth. And they are so pleased to see its misery. What you find here is mature evil. Mature evil is not discouraged by pain. Pain is its point. And God the Father does not look kindly on such fiendish tyrannies. In Genesis 11, the whole earth conspired together to build a tower unto heaven. And seeing that there was no limit to their evil, the Lord split them apart that their plans would be limited. We need to understand the reason why there are nations borders that that the world is actually divided up that's not because God was being cruel division among people in tongues was actually a restraint against evil as a gift to people when the tyrant comes in charge you don't want him to be ruling the whole earth and guess what whenever the people of the earth come together and conspire the beast comes out of the sea now there will be one final beast I'm not just saying this is a metaphor for every tyranny out there no that there will be the final one but evil comes up and sits in the throne of iniquity. You build this big nation. You, you put together a large empire. Evil is going to make its way to that throne. That is human history. The church has bought the lie of globalism. It's in the name. That's a worldly way of living. The reason why God gave us the separate nations in the tower, in the story of the Tower of Babel there in Genesis 11, is as a gift to restrain evil for you. It's easier to hold one other person accountable. Somebody comes into my house and I get out of hand, it's easier for one other person to slow me down. Or, if I do do something wicked, I'm only limited to doing it to that one other person. But the larger we make societies, the larger we make things, the more we go globally, the more it goes from being just one person afflicted to millions and millions, and there is no restraint for it. Having borders is a restraint against evil. It's not just about you know, not wanting people to come over and being unfriendly. It's, it's actually about restraining evil. It's, it's about restraining those governments which come into power because they are evil. 
People may not like that. They may wish for a different utopia, but that's just sorceress, you know, wish casting. The truth of the matter is we are not capable of having a singular leader until Christ himself comes back and smites all heaven and earth with fire. And then there's a new creation. All other attempts to do that is going to look like the whore and the beast here in Revelation 17. And to that point, it's time for a real study of Romans 13. Romans 13.1 begins, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, our modern age is tragically soft-headed. We are surrounded by a lot of soft-headed thinkers, and the church has a lot of, of, of teachers that do not have realistic and firm understandings of the Holy Scriptures. They don't treat the Holy Scriptures as holy writ, but as ways to justify their own personality. Romans 13.1 is a statement about the providential structure, and it's very obviously so. This is saying God has designed this. This is what God has established. No authorities exist that have not been established by God. This is the providential structure. This is clearly not a past declaring every worldly leader as righteous just because they have stolen into worldly power. Insofar as we remember that fathers were established as the heads of households, now kings are to be the heads of nations. A unique responsibility has been placed upon them. Unique people have been given unique talents. However, they are still sinners. We are sinners, and it is easy to easily discovered that many men have failed in their household, just as many peace priests have failed in their post. All the same, that was the design that God declared. If Romans 13 meant that every worldly leader that is out there gets a pass and they are now declared righteous and worthy of submission, then God's own actions in Exodus would be a sin. David would have never replaced Saul. Esther would have been silent on behalf of her people and that would have been the righteous thing to do. Jesus would have never healed on the Sabbath. He would have silenced his tongue, and he would have never faced the cross. He would have obeyed the will of the Pharisees and done nothing to upset Pilate. Paul, who literally wrote these words, Paul, the one who wrote Romans 13, would have fornicated in the temples as required by the Pax Dorum, and he would have then snuffed out the churches to obey his fellow Pharisees and to appease the worries of Rome. The man who wrote this would be in sin if it meant what the soft-headed people think it means. And it would have made no sense for him to write it. He wrote this to talk about the providential order. Going back to Exodus, you look in Exodus 18. Some people who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate dishonest gain, they're to be put over tens, hundreds, thousands, and ten thousands. Sometimes unique people are given unique responsibilities. And if they fail, they fail, and God will give punishment to them. But not every one of them is righteous and worthy of submission. That's why when you go on further down in Romans 13, it says, Give honor to those whom honor is due. And again, not everybody is worthy of honor. Paul did not find Rome worthy of honor. He, he is beheaded by Rome. Romans 13, it's not a slogan, it's not a platitudinal verdict declaring all worldly leaders worthy of submission. It is a declaration of God's design. And if we honor that design, it's actually a very good thing because that restrains evil. God gave certain people certain talents. And again, it's meant to be a restraint against evil. And again, those who are up under other people, you you are meant to to recognize that order and respect it as a restraint against your own evil. It's a restraint against chaos. From there, each must choose whether to be noble or wicked with the talents that are given to them. God honors the noble, but the wicked have chosen their own curse. And I tell all of this that, that Romans 13 is talking about the order which God has made because I want us to understand the magnitude of evil in Revelation 17 because when you understand the truth of Romans 13, it actually makes Revelation 17 a little bit worse because it's not just enough for them to be tyrants, but the plain fact of global tyranny is itself a blasphemy. The fact that they are tyrants are, is a blasphemy against one of God's designs. God designed that if you are now to be in charge of a nation, you have unique responsibility. Being a tyrant in itself is a sin against that design of God's. 
And what you find here is not only have they soiled one nation, but every nation on earth is now infected with their sin. The restraint of Babel in Genesis 11 is undone, and the order of God is stained with the corrupt head over every land. The kings have furthermore consummated their evil, mixing their blood with the throne of iniquity. In this chapter, you see every attempt being made to unmake the good. And they have succeeded more in this chapter than ever before. It is a monstrous chapter. A monstrous chapter. You read Revelation 13, and, and it has a few spooky things in it. One, no one repents in the age of the beast for 42 months. You find that the final blasphemy, this monster, the image of the beast, even though it, it's not born, it comes with the, the breath of life somehow, that all of those things are heinous. But then when you get to Revelation 17, again, another heinous scene because they have rebelled against every natural and moral law of, moral law of God. They have rebelled in so many ways. It's, it's just monstrous. I'm not sure that mankind has ever understood the prospect where all kings of the earth might assemble together for some singular sin. In the past, the notion that all the kings would come together was so absurd that it could only happen in the realm of fantasy. And now, it is so common that it raises no suspicion at all. And whatever suspicion it does awake, is dismissed as the obsession of madmen. Yet, the great revelation set before us is either true or it is not. It is either the fulfillment of all hope or the rambling of insane zealots. And if it is the latter, being nothing more than feverish ranting, then scripture itself is a liar, and we are doomed to the hunger of evil, whose mouth will not be satisfied. So what then can the righteous do? Well, we hold fast to the foundations. The verse that we're learning this, this month out of um, Psalm is, to, is this, What then shall the righteous do if the foundations be destroyed? If the foundations be destroyed, what then can the righteous do? We hold fast to the foundations. It's always fun peering over the edge and being there you know, at the edge of chaos, but falling off the cliff is bad. It, it, it's a mortal failure. We must let go of all pride and honor and the correction God gives us. Let go of all pride and honor the correction that God gives us. In Hebrews 12, 9, what we learn is this. We have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? That last word, live is what I want to emphasize. It is vital to our study of Revelation 17. Do not take the path of destruction. Do not be unmade by the infernal whispers. Receive the rope from God that will deliver us home and receive His grace and live. As we come to the end of our message today, I do just want to spend, spend another moment emphasizing Psalm 11.3. If the foundations be destroyed, what then can the righteous do? They try real hard to destroy the foundations in Revelation 17. And they get pretty close. But in the end, Jesus is victorious. I've read the end of the book, and I feel pretty good about it. God love you, and have a blessed day.